Please rise. The text for this morning that I've chosen to share with you comes from the gospel reading from Luke chapter 14, which Pastor Adi just read for you. Verse 27. Jesus said, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is the word of God before us. Please be seated. <clears throat> well, grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. How many of you have ever been victims of impulse buying or impulse purchases? I must admit, whenever I'm at a grocery store and I have all four of my children with me, it's quite difficult to get through that line. Everything to their left and right becomes a must-have. I want that. I need that candy. I want that chocolate. Why can't I have that? I frequently use the phrase, look with your eyes, but don't look with your hands. Please don't touch it, put it back. As we patiently await the process of checking out in the grocery store. There was recently an article that talked about the influence of TikTok and Instagram in impulse purchasing. In fact, the article mentioned that 64% of consumers admitted that they had regretted at least one impulse buy they made in their life. One Instagram user said that she was seeing all of these advertisements for a Nintendo Switch within Instagram, and so she went over to Amazon and quickly bought it, and it was there the next day. She said, wow, that was a big purchase. I don't know why I did that. Another user, a TikTok user, ended up seeing all of these advertisements for skincare products, so they went over to Amazon and bought hundreds of dollars worth of skincare products and didn't realize all that they had bought when it arrived the next day. In fact, a bank rate analyst named Sarah Foster gives sort of a remedy to combat this impulse purchasing. She said just to simply use the 24-hour rule. That means use your phone, go onto Amazon, put the item in your cart, and wait 24 hours, one full day, to see if you really need the item or if you really want the item. Well, in the gospel reading before us from Luke chapter 14, Jesus is talking about a cost. At this point, he is making his way to Jerusalem, and he has become increasingly popular. There were some crowds accompanying him. And as he's making his way to Jerusalem, he, as noted in Luke chapter 9, is going there with a purpose, to be the sacrifice for all of our sin. But on his way there, he tells these crowds something very shocking. He says to them, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow, that must have been incredibly difficult to hear. And yet Jesus is not talking about an impulse purchase here. No, he's talking about something different. He's telling these crowds to really sit down and count the cost. Following Jesus involves a great sacrifice. You see, this isn't the first time that Jesus had talked to these crowds about the sacrifices that they would have to make in following him. No, he's talked with them before about being followers, about hating their families and carrying a cross and giving up their possessions. They've all heard these things before. And yet he knew that there would be some who would be unwilling to do those things, to leave their human families, to follow him. But does Jesus really mean that we are to hate our own fathers and mothers and wives and children and brothers and sisters and even our own soul? Well, Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 says it very clearly, that we are not to love our families more than Jesus. What Jesus is doing is he's flipping the way the Old Testament Jews understood the family of God. He is telling them that we need to put God first and to love our fellow Christians. As he said in Luke 8, verse 21, 
my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. But then Jesus gives another cost. He says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. These crowds have heard his word. They have left their families. They understood the the kind of sacrifice involved with following him. But as they travel with Jesus, it's as if Jesus knew that they were going to encounter persecution and rejection, that they would face temptation and difficult days ahead. And then Jesus decides to tell two parables. The first one is about a builder. One who needs to sit down first and really weigh the cost of the building project. Determining the cost of labor, the cost of materials, everything associated with that building. Otherwise, that person would build and only have a foundation and never finish. And have people laugh at that person because they didn't finish. Or a king who decides to go against war. He must first sit down and really weigh the cost. What is going to be gained? What will be lost before going to war? Jesus isn't leaving any room for impulse purchases here, is he? You see, what Jesus is doing is he's telling us that as baptized children of God, we are part of a new family. We are part of his family, the family of God. And as followers of Jesus, we lose the world and we gain only a cross while in this world. And what Jesus has given you and me are the supplies to get through this very difficult life. He's given you and me our baptisms. He's given us his word of forgiveness. He's given us communion and he continues to give us these wonderful good gifts all the time. As baptized children of God, though, we don't rush off into Jesus' war thinking that we can just win it all on our own, that we can do it all ourselves. No, the enemy is very powerful, and we are very much outnumbered. And the only way to win, though, is to carry the cross that Jesus carried, to follow him. He is the one who brings you and me victory through his death on the cross. He is the one who brings you and me peace. So he's telling these crowds, warning them to really sit down, to count the cost, to know what they lose and what they gain when following and going with him. This last part of discipleship, though, is all about possessions. Jesus talks about how these possessions can get in the way of following him. He says, So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Again, it's very clear here that Jesus wants to be the number one thing above all things and people in our lives. So Jesus clearly lays out the cost of following him, family ties, the burden of his cross and possessions being renounced. But as Jesus is teaching these crowds about the cost of following him, I can't help but think about the weight upon his shoulders, the cost that's in front of him as he's making his way to Jerusalem. He is aware of the tremendous burden that he is going to have all of the weight of our sin upon his shoulders as he prepares to suffer and die on the cross and giving up everything, even his own life, and becoming the sacrifice for your sin and my sin. What an amazing thing that he's done for us, that he willingly gave up his life so that we could have forgiveness of all of our sins. But this last part of Jesus' teaching and following him is all about salt. You see, salt is very valuable, and it has a great purpose. It helps to preserve food, and maybe food that doesn't taste really good can be saved by a little seasoning of salt. But if salt loses its ability to preserve or to season food, it would be worthless. There is no way to restore it. It would lose its purpose and would not even be useful 
for improving soil or helping to decompose a garbage pile. And yet you and I, as Jesus says here, we, through his death and resurrection, we are the salt of the earth. That means that with the gift of faith you and I have been given, we can share that light. We can share his light through our words and our actions as we follow him in this world. Jesus is telling us to remain salty. Don't lose that saltiness. And because of what he's done for you and for me, we will have heaven one day. So as we think about the cost of following Jesus, let us also rejoice that Jesus has paid the price for your sin and my sin, that he has done it all, that he's given you and me hope and peace in this life. And one day we will be with him forever in heaven. Let us cling to his promises and to his wonderful gift of mercy and grace. God bless you all. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard in your, your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise for the sermon response hymn.